it is my great, great honor to introduce David Gill, who is the Consul General of the Federal Republic of Germany in New York City. And some of you may already know him from last year's Goethe Institute project commemorating the 30 year anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, for which he shared fascinating insights about how he experienced the fall of the wall. Born in 1966, Consul General Gill grew up in a Protestant minister's family in Herrnhut, Saxony in former East Germany. He was initially denied a higher education by the communist regime and instead trained and worked as a plumber. In 1989, the year the wall fell, Consul General Gill witnessed the fall of the Berlin Wall and he participated in the peaceful revolution which facilitated the reunification of East and West Germany. So as we say, he's a true Zeitzeuge, a contemporary witness of an important historical event. In his lecture today, Consul General Gill will highlight the process that led towards German unity and we'll talk about the huge progress that has been made since the reunification of Germany 30 years ago. But he will also underscore that the work is not yet finished. Um, throughout the presentation, the chat and the Q&A pod is open for you and we really encourage you to ask questions at any point and I'll make sure to point them out to Consul General Gill so that he can engage with your questions also. But now, without further ado, Consul General David Gill, welcome. Thank you, Stefan Kalb, and good afternoon to all of you. I'm very happy to be with you this afternoon, and congratulations to the Goethe Institute for this great project. I love to work together with you last year, and I'm really happy to see what you accomplished this year as well. And uh, I, my feeling is it is well received by people who learn Germany, but also who want to learn uh, about our history, our country, what our country means and what are the things we are talking about. So my topic today is from the peaceful revolution to in the communist East to a united Germany. And so you could uh, think I would talk about the year of 1990 or maybe 1989 when the wall fell until the reunification which happened um, on 3rd of October of 1990, so almost exactly 30 years ago. Um, but uh, to understand this whole process of reunification, um, I think it's good to uh, look a little further back and to start at the year of 1945, as you can see in the slide in front of you. Mm -hmm. um, the end of the war also meant a new era of German history. Of course, Germany was the paria. Uh, Germany had um, brought uh, death and destruction over the whole world and uh, now had to start again. And uh, the situation in Germany was like this. There were four uh, victorious powers, the Soviet Union, uh, the United States, the United Kingdom and France, who conquered Germany and who uh, decided in the conference of Potsdam to divide the country in four occupational zones. There was the British, the French, the American, and the Russian or Soviet Union zone in the east. And the former capital of Germany, uh, Berlin, was divided in four sectors. Each of the powers had one sector they oversaw. At this time also, and we can slowly go to the next uh, slide, at this time um, also the Cold War started. By uh, the victorious powers, um, fought together against uh, the Nazi Germany, uh, they had different interests in their occupational zones. And for the East, the Soviet zone, it was very clear uh, that the Soviet Union, that Stalin, the leader of this time, um, wanted to form a communist country and wanted to have part of Germany under the influence uh, of the Soviet Union and part of the uh, region where uh, Moscow was uh, the superpower. 
And in the West, America, after uh, first hesitant, uh, but then uh, was very clear that uh, the goal was together with the British and the France to rebuild uh, Germany as a democratic country and uh, particularly the United States supported uh, Germany, the Western part, part first, uh, uh, tremendously to rebuild an economy and also to rebuild a democratic uh, society with the rule of law and the freedoms uh, the people in America enjoyed uh, also in this time. So it was also the beginning, as I said, of the Cold War. And there was a competition bit, between capitalism and communism. And uh, this uh, competition was particularly um, obvious in Germany, since one country with two systems in two parts. Um, it took about four years until uh, not only the country was divided in four um, occupational zones, but in two countries. Um, to the day today, on October 7th, 71 years ago, October 7th in 49, uh, East Germany, the so-called German Democratic Republic was, built, uh, was founded. Uh, in the name, it was a democratic republic in fact, it was no democracy in this country, not even in the beginning. And a couple of months before, in the western part of Germany, uh, containing of the three occupational zones, the French, the British and the American, they had formed the Federal Republic of Germany. So, and those two countries uh, took two very different routes um, in all the different parts and fields of the society, legally, um, institutionally, how to deal with religions and with the economy. All this went in very different directions in the West and in the East. The West enjoyed in the 50s also a prosperity, a rebuild of the economy, people became more wealthy um, and in the East, and, and they also were heavily supported by the United States with the so-called Marshall Pla Plan, uh, a tremendous um, uh, influential plan to rebuild the economy in the West. And in the East, uh, East Germany still had to pay rep reparations from the war to the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union um, um, implemented the ec ec economic system they uh, used in the Soviet Union. So the disparity between the two parts of Germany uh, uh, became bigger and bigger, the difference is bigger and bigger. Um, in the West they enjoyed freedom, freedom of press and speech, they could slowly travel to France, Spain, or wherever. In the East, um, people um, didn't enjoy freedoms. It was very clear from the beginning that the Communist uh, um, uh, Party would rule the country in all its parts. People were imprisoned for political reasons. Uh, people who went to church and uh, confessed their religion were under, under persecution because religion and communism didn't, uh, uh, didn't uh, fit uh, in a way. So you were considered as an oppo opposition uh, when you would join the church. So, and more and more people felt in the East, we want to spend our life under this oppression. We want to go to the West and enjoy a, a, a living where we could, can be free, where we are not uh, um, in this ideological influence of the East. And so in the 50s, uh, almost 2 million East Germans left East Germany. Um, and the wall was not up yet, the border was still uh, uh, not close like it was later, 
And the regime in East Germany saw that uh, their own people uh, would prefer to go to the West. And so they had the idea and then they indeed built a wall uh, between the two uh, parts of Berlin, West Berlin and East Berlin, and they closed the border between East and West Germany. But you can, can we see the last um, slide? Uh, briefly. There you can see it's not only west and east but Berlin, West Berlin, that's the green part in the east. There was a part of the west in the middle of East Germany. So around this green, green island, that's West Berlin, there was, a, there, was a, there was a wall and between DDR and BRD, East Germany, West Germany, there was a, a border you couldn't pass easily. People tried to flee after the wall uh, was put up in 1961 and they wanted, they tried to flee uh, the, the, the border between East and West Germany, but uh, more than 200 people died when they tried to leave East Germany because this border was heavily uh, guarded and it was a crime to leave East Germany and people who were caught Either they were shot or they were caught, and when they were caught uh, while they tried to flee East Germany, they were imprisoned for two or four or even more years because it, because it was considered a crime to leave East Germany. This was the situation in the 60s, and that was the time when I was born. In 1966, you can see some pictures of me and my family. As you can see, I have a lot of siblings, um, which is wonderful. and. Um, so I grew up in this situation, as you heard, in a, a Protestant minister's family, which also shaped my life very much in East Germany. I already mentioned it, the church was somehow um, accepted by the regime, but regarded as not fitting into this system. And if you were um, active in the church, it was very clear that you wouldn't be able to have a career in East Germany, not even a higher education. However, um, growing up in a family um, which um, was open to discussions also politically was uh, also an um, advantage, um, at least for your own awareness of what is right and what is wrong. And so I enjoyed uh, growing up in a Christian congregation and in the house, um, in, in a minister's house. In 1972, that's the next slide, um, I started school. And uh, uh, while the whole country was ruled by the communist regime and the communist party, the schools and the whole educational uh, system was particularly controlled by the communist uh, party and the communist regime. Because um, this regime used the kindergartens, school, universities to form the young people as follower of the regime. And um, the school and already kindergarten, you learned uh, that um, 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 disapproving uh, or questioning uh, things which were um, considered normality in East Germany uh, would bring you in trouble. And so um, teachers were not only uh, teachers, they were also um, in a way, yeah, they told you what is right and what is wrong and in some ways um, they uh, yeah, uh, they didn't help you to, to discover the world, but they wanted to make sure that, that you would obey into this regime. Of course, we had uh, normal school education as you enjoy here in this country or in Germany, we had biology, physics, etc. But all this school was used as an instrument of controlling the young people in the country where I grew up. Um, 
you can see the next slide. Um, of course, we had, sometimes I'm asked, did you have normal life? Did you have, did you enjoy your time in East Germany? Yes, of course. Uh, we also could enjoy vacations. We had uh, uh, something like a prom, as you can see there. Uh, I enjoyed my family, but it was a clear division between a private life and school. And school was not considered as only a place where you can lear learn for, for your life, but it was also a place um, where you feared that you would say the wrong thing and then you could get in trouble. Because that's what you learned as a student. Don't disagree with the regime. And um, many people um, were not willing to risk um, disadvantages just because they uh, disagreed with the regime. Even, even though they uh, disagreed uh, internally, they wouldn't say so publicly. Um, as I mentioned, for me, it was very important to grow up in a church. And uh, the role of the Protestant church, and also the Catholic church, but East Germany was predominantly Protestant before, the, uh, um, before East Germany was uh, as a state was built. The church was the only place in the society which was not controlled by the communist regime. And that's why um, the church was also the only place where you could speak openly, where you had a shelter somehow from the regime. And that's why people came under the roof of the church um, as Christians, but also as people who disagreed with the regime. And the church was in this way, not only a spiritual place, it was also a place of political opposition. And that's what I learned from the beginning. When people had problems in our congregation, had problems with the regime, when they disagreed with decisions of the regime, they came to my father for help. And uh, all these groups who questioned uh, the um, um, only power of the communist regime, who questions economical decisions, political decisions, who questioned the militarization of the society, they found refuge in the churches and they built groups in the churches um, uh, where they could discuss their beliefs and their political convictions. And that was, that's why, um, and I uh, switch a little forward, that's why the churches played also such a big role in the peaceful revolution in the year of 89 in East Germany. Um, it uh, began in a way in the mid 80s already that changes were, um, could be realized in East Germany. And one uh, interesting change in this mid 80s was uh, not even happened in East Germany, but in Moscow. Until the mid 80s, Moscow was seen by the East Germans as the oppressor, oppressor and um, uh, that uh, be feared uh, what was going on in Moscow. And people in East Germany, in Eastern Europe, remembered the role of the Soviet Union uh, in the uprisings in, East, in, in, in Eastern Europe in 53. Uh, workers in East Germany had demonstrated against the regime in East Berlin and Russian tanks uh, ended these demonstrations. In 57 in Hungary the same happened and in 1968 it happened in Czechoslovakia where they tried to form a reformation of the communist, uh, communist country in Czechoslovakia. And also this reformation was ended by Soviet tanks. But in 85, a um, pretty young leader was elected in the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev, and he spoke a very different language 
than the leaders before. He talked about perestroika and glasnost, transparency and uh, accountability. Um, and we in the East looked uh, at Moscow and we uh, thought, um, well, that is something we didn't hear from our leaders in East Germany, from Erich Honecker, whom you can see uh, in one of these pictures, um, who was the leader in East Germany. He was very much in the old language. And so people uh, started to become hopeful that something could change in East Germany. And then uh, the year 89 came. And in all the Eastern European countries, there started slow movements, particularly in Poland. Poland had experienced an uprising in the early 80s, which was ended by martial law in 81. But in 88, 89, the oppositional movement became stronger and stronger. And in East Germany, people more and more discussed, what do we want to have in this country? We want to have openness. We want to have um, free elections. And people um, questioned, not openly, but in their private uh, groups more and more, the power of the communist regime. Then in the summer of 1989, people start, um, um, uh, it started in Hungary, that um, certain, particularly Hungary in the beginning, a communist country opened the uh, 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 Iron Curtain, the, 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 the border to, to Austria. And so uh, the East Germans who were not able to leave the country since 1961, now by the 10,000s um, left East Germany via Hungary to the West. And the regime became weaker and weaker. And people um, who had met in the churches before for services, for prayers, etc., started to pour out on the streets. It started in Leipzig uh, in October 1990 and then went through the whole country. And what we wanted to have in East Germany was a change of power. We wanted democracy, we wanted to have free parties and free elections, and we didn't even think so much at this moment of a reunification of Germany. That was so unthinkable as much as unthinkable was that the wall was, would fall overnight. However, um, on November 9th, as you might remember or read in the history books, um, the wall fell um, unexpectedly. Um, this was one of the uh, biggest obstacles for many, many East Germans that they were not able to travel to the West. I was 23 when the wall fell and I had never been on the West side, even so I had friends and family living there. So, and then the wall fell and uh, people went to the West and were happy and our uh, West German neighbors were happy that we were able to join them. It was really a night of um, joy and uh, un yeah, people couldn't believe what they experienced. So, um, but this was still the time when we had a communist regime or communist government um, and we had to organize now a new system in a way. Um, we didn't have free elections uh, for 40 years in East Germany and the question was how do you organize the reformation of a whole country? And uh, First, before we had elections, uh, we looked how other countries uh, did this transformation. And Poland had invented a very interesting transformation uh, instrument, the so-called uh, round table. A round table where um, uh, the old parties or the communist party and the old parties of the old East Germany set together 
with representatives of the new parties um, and discussed how can we organize this transformation. That was the first step towards democracy in East Germany. And then on March 18th in 1919, we had our first and only free election in East Germany, which was incredibly important for uh, the people of East Germany to embrace the new freedom and the new system of democracy. And um, um, people wanted to have this openness in democracy. More than 95% of the, of the um, eligible voters of East Germany really um, went to vote. That was overwhelming to see how much the uh, people in East Germany uh, the longing to be citizens uh, who can um, who can decide who should um, uh, govern this country, and for me, I I, I won't forget it how uh, how the whole atmosphere was that people felt now we are real citizens, and that's why when I talk about the election in East Germany. I always tell the people in countries where they take um, uh, democracy for granted. Um, no, it's not for granted. I remember the time when we didn't have a democrat democratic system in East Germany. And democracy um, needs the people uh, who live democracy. And that's not only those who serve in parliaments or in the public service, but also those who go and vote and decide who should run the country. So this was very important. But even in this time, we were not um, expecting that half a year later, our country would be reunited already. There were groups in the political establishment, or establishments, maybe not the right, right word, but political groups who um, were um, discussing if there would be a third way somehow between capitalism and communism. And they wanted to, to use the chance of transformation to see if there's something what could serve social equality, democracy, uh, and the living together of the people. And they were thinking maybe we take uh, some more years as East Germany and transform our society. But the um, vast majority of the East Germans, they didn't want to do more experiments. They had enough of 40 years um, socialist or communist experiment and they wanted to join the uh, Western part of Germany, the Federal Republic of Germany, because they saw the great advantages which happened in the West. Democracy, a strong economy, a judicial system which worked. And so the parties in power in East Germany realized more and more uh, there is no time and no willingness in the majority of the East Germans to stay alone and to try something new. The East Germans wanted to join West Germany and to reunify uh, with the Western part of Germany. And that happened much faster than we had expected. In July 1990, we had a monetary union already because um, the East Germans wanted to be part of the monetary system of West Germany. And in October 1990, uh, the reunification came. Less than a year, um, after we still had a functioning East Germany under communist rulership, less than a year after East Germany had um, celebrated um, uh, its 40th birthday. But with the reunification, it was not the paradise from day one. There came problems, of course there came problems. Um, the economies were so different and 
basically the East, it was a broken economy and everybody knew it before the wall fell and then they realized, yes, this economy uh, was broken and not at all compatible to the rest of the world or at least of the Western world and not compatible to the econom uh, economic system in West Germany. So um, companies by the thousands had uh, to close and people by the hundred thousands, by the millions uh, lost their job. And this was a very hard time for many, many people, um, particularly those who were in their forties or fifties and they realized um, that they gained freedom and they gained dem democracy. But what they had hoped that they could be, there would be a chance for them to take part in, in the new um, development, in the new economy, they realized um, they didn't have a perspective for jobs in the next 10 years or so. And that meant for many people, a great disappointment. We always should remember that. Um, but on the other hand, there happened a lot of good things. We uh, adapted a judicial system uh, which um, made clear that the rule of law was, the, uh, was uh, governing our country, which we uh, didn't experience the 40 years before. Um, the infrastructure was um, rebuilt in East Germany, which was broken as well. The towns and cities of East Germany, uh, which were falling apart, uh, literally, uh, were rebuilt and many, many um, 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 reconstruction was going on in the early 90s and until today. The environment, which was in a terrible um, uh, um, state, uh, uh, was rebuilt in many, many parts. And so uh, many things um, went or turned out to be to be really beneficial uh, for the East. Um, but also um, the younger generation um, in many cases moved on, moved to the West because they were mobile. So uh, whole regions in the East experienced um, a drain of knowledge and of um, development of young families, etc., because the jobs were in the West in the beginning. So this shaped um, East Germany or the Eastern part of Germany uh, very much in the first years of the reunification. And until today, there are differences. Uh, there are still differences in the wages, not as big as they were in 30 years ago, but there are differences. There are differences in the um, pensions and of course the industrialization of East Germany is much behind of this in the West because um, uh, not so much of the reunification but because of the um, devastating economy in East Germany. On the other hand, um, there are differences between North and South as well. And um, over the years, the differences are not only between East and West, but there are differences in the regions. And we should always see that we are a very colorful country in Germany. And Saxony looks different than Baden-Württemberg or Schleswig-Holstein and in some uh, parts of the uh, uh, economy or the situation in a region, we are maybe closer with some parts of West Germany uh, than um, the North and the South. And of course, generations who came after reunification look very different uh, at, at their country and they don't have the experiences of the last 30 years. They look uh, in the future and they have very similar experiences 
when they come from Leipzig or Frankfurt or Munich. And I think that is something we uh, should always put into consideration. Our country was divided for more than 40 years and is now unified for 30 years. So it is very natural that it takes time um, until the reunification is uh, total. And maybe there will be differences um, uh, for many, many more years and we have to deal with that. Okay, that's what I wanted to say and I hope we can do Q&As and I can uh, go more in detail to what you are interested in uh, and not just talk. Great, thank you so much, um, Consul General Gill, um, for the very interesting presentation. I think we've gotten a very, very broad and sort of multifaceted view of your experience growing up in East Germany and also some very interesting thoughts of where we stand today with this reunification process 30 years after the official reunification. And we also have some first questions already. Um, one from the chat um, from Kevin who says, about the fall of the Berlin Wall, I was taught in college, I majored in modern German history, that we, the Germans themselves, reunited Germany themselves. Is that actually true? So sort of who was it who brought together the two Germanys? Who was the driving force behind this reunification? Yeah, I wish I would be with you. I really, it's, it's not so much fun to sit in front of a, of a screen and talk into my computer, but um, well, so who was the driving force? I would say definitely it were the Germans themselves and particularly the East Germans, uh, who uh, in the majority um, 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 were very clear they wanted to reunite with the West, they wanted to live in the Federal Republic of Germany. And you could tell this um, 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 with, the, with the result of the uh, first and only three elections I talked about. So the, 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 the movements who really brought uh, or, or, or made the peaceful revolution uh, possible the, uh, in, in, in the late 80, in, in the fall of 89, they lost this election. And the CDU, which actually was not so active in the peaceful revolution, but then um, was a political power as a party and uh, had a coalition with the West German CDU, with the Chancellor, um, Kohl, um, they won this election. And this was very clear. The East Germans wanted to go rather quicker than uh, slower into reunification. But we couldn't have reunited uh, without the support of our allies, and particularly of the four powers uh, US, USA, France, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union. Um, in a way, the post-war era was not, had not yet ended. And so in order to, uh, to, to, um, uh, to reunite, uh, we had to have um, 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 the so-called two, two plus four um, 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 Verhandlung. What's sometimes I the negotiations? Plus, yeah, the two for, plus four for agreement. Yeah. Agreement between the, the the occupational powers and the two Germanys uh, for the reunification. The American, uh, the American President uh, Bush Senior and his Foreign Minister Baker, they were very supportive in this process, and it was important that not only the Germans, but also the four uh, occupational powers agreed that Germany could be reunited. Great, thank you. Thank you so much um, for this great answer. Um, Heidi Gibson is asking, why did the Stasi not infiltrate the churches to see what was going on there? Yeah, I didn't talk about the Stasi so much today. I think I did this last year and some of you might recall this. So of course the Stasi uh, tried to infiltrate the church as well. And um, they wanted to know what was going on in the church. And so they had spies all over the church uh, as well. Um, but somehow um, the 
church was also useful for some things the um, regime wanted to achieve. First of all, they wanted uh, international reputation of a country where there's free uh, freedom of religion. And so they always could, could, could point to the fact, look, there are the churches uh, and they exist in our country and people can go to uh, and, and follow their religion. They wouldn't tell the international community that it had consequences when you joined the church. The consequence was the consequences were um, no no higher education and, and no career in the state or in the economy. Uh, second, um, the churches also um, played in not an openly, but uh, um, uh, um, they played a role in the connection between East and West. They were somehow messengers and supporters of an um, uh, exchange between the government in Bonn, in the West and in Berlin, uh, which couldn't always speak openly and the churches helped to negotiate between uh, those two uh, parts of Germany. And what was also uh, of interest for East Germany, the West German churches supported the East German churches heavily, not only spiritually, but also economically. So the churches were all also interesting, uh, interesting for, for, the, for the East German government as somebody who could gain uh, hard currency. So it was also an economical factor, I would say. Great, thank you very much. Um, and another question that goes back to the topic of education um, comes from Olympia Gonzalez and she asks, so you were first prohibited a, a higher education. How did you catch up with your studies? Because it's pretty hard if you're prohibited by your government to pursue a higher education. How did you deal with that? Good question. So, um, yes, I, um, I had a chance within the church to get uh, an education. Um, I attended, after I was trained as a plumber and worked as a plumber, I attended a kind of um, high school run by the church, which uh, the degree wasn't uh, acknowledged by the, by, the, by, the, by the state university, but it was education within the church. And that's why I got a great education in East Germany, um, um, uh, not ideologized, it doesn't help me to study anything at the university. And I would have become a, a Protestant minister. The, 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 the churches ran theologic, theological seminaries and in 88, I came to Berlin to study theology and to become a minister, which was more than just being a spiritual leader of your congregation. As I tried to explain uh, before, um, as a minister and as a church congregation, you supported people not only spiritually but also politically, and you could uh, you could um, provide um, a, a, a space for open discussion, and uh, that's what I wanted to do in in this country because I saw that people needed this support and help. Thank, thank you so much. And to stay with the topic of education for a second, a very interesting question from Eric who asks, so um, were you aware of the fact that your education that you were getting in East Germany was different than the education um, children would get in West Germany? And sort of when did you learn about it? Were you aware at the time? Did you learn about this later, this awareness of its one's own situation? Not everybody in East Germany was aware of that, but most were aware of this, and that's for very uh, various reasons. First of all, many East Germans had relatives in the West, and there was an um, exchange. We couldn't travel to the West, but at least they could visit us. And of course, you discussed with your cousins, uh, what do you learn in school? And you told them what, what we learned in school. There were also um, relationships between church congregations and also there was an exchange about what is going on in your country and our country. Um, and um, we had a slide for, for this, uh, but I didn't talk about this. What was also special in East Germany, uh, three quarters of the East Germans somehow lived at least um, in their mind 
uh, for half an hour in West Germany. Most of, East German, uh, most of the East Germans were able to watch West German TV, and they did so. And so they were pretty good informed what was going on in West Germany. Um, they watched the news and they knew more about uh, the politics in West Germany than in East Germany, because in West Germany there was free press and they talked about what was going on in the government. In East Germany there was, the press was propaganda. And um, you, wouldn't, uh, um, you wouldn't know what, what was going on in the government. And so there was an awareness uh, about the differences. There was an awareness about what was going wrong in East Germany. Um, and however, people had learned from kindergarten on and school on how to deal with the situation in your own country. And you wouldn't talk openly about this. And you would tell your teacher what they wanted to hear, but at home he knew that the education, I don't talk about biology, physics, etc. I talk about history and German uh, and, 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 and communist ideology. Uh, you knew uh, that this is, a lot of this is ideology and propaganda and not what uh, they, you would learn in a free country. Yeah, I find this tension very interesting between the awareness of the differences, but also knowing that um, you can't always openly talk about those. Um, another question that keeps us sort of in your childhood experiences is from James who says, what were your experiences as a child um, concerning the Junge Pioniere or other GDR youth organizations? And I, what role did those play in yeah, your life? I, 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 I could have talked about all of this, but there was too little time and I had already talked too much. And um, so, yeah, um, two instruments to, 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 to bind children and youngsters to this uh, regime and to implement the ideology in those were the organization of students and pupils. So uh, the, 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 the uh, students from elementary uh, school, they usually had to join the so-called Junge Pioneer, Young Pioneers. And uh, that was, um, yeah, the communist children's movement and they met once a week or once a month to talk about all the advantages of communism uh, they enjoy in this beautiful country, East Germany. And then when you grow older, you joined the so-called free, uh, free German Youth, the FDJ, and, um, which was also, also, also called uh, the, the Kampfreserve der Partei, the, the, the poor. Haben Sie Vorschlag sort of like the, the battle reserve of the party, maybe? Yeah, <laughs> so it was considered as the resource for, for future party members. So, and 99% of my peers joined the FDJ because if you didn't, it was very clear you were against this regime. And if you were uh, considered as being in opposition to this regime, you would risk your higher education, you would risk to uh, go to university, you would also be, um, um, yeah, you would risk this. And so that's why um, all my, 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 my classmates joined the FDJ, uh, even though they, they didn't believe in it. But it was um, a great instrument to discipline uh, young people in East Germany. Great. Since we're getting close to the top of the hour, I want to ask two more questions that I find highly interesting. And the first one um, is asking, would you be comfortable sharing anything that you perhaps missed about society once the GDR became part of the West? <laughs> um, the, for me, the good things or the, 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 the things I remember in East Germany were special, were special because uh, they helped me to survive in this environment. There was a certain personal awareness and certain closeness of the people, um, um, also in my congregation, but even further 
uh, that you would support each other. There was maybe some more solidarity. I don't know if this is right, but it was uh, it was a result of this system. Uh, and we always should 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 uh, uh, recognize this when we think of this time and 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 get a certain nostalgic um, to this time. No, that was not funny and and um, uh, things um, who seem, if you look back, as um, enjoyable uh, uh, would have lost their, 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 their joy when, or lost their joy when, when the regime was gone. No, I, I really don't miss, I really don't miss anything of this time. Great. And maybe sort of as the last question to bring everything together, we often talk about this concept of Vergangenheitsbewältigung, dealing with the past in relationship to, to Nazi Germany. But the question that was asked was also, has United, Reunified Germany ever really sort of confronted the past of, the, of divided Germany? How has the past of people who grew up in East Germany been integrated into the narrative of now Unified Germany? Has that ever been adequately addressed that half of the country live differently for 40 years or so? Maybe two answers. Um, I think to cope with our, uh, our past, um, we invested a lot over the last 30 years, particularly with, uh, to cope with the suppression and to cope with the role of the Stasi and uh, um, to um, give the victims of this time a voice again, there happened a lot. And it was very important that we immediately um, um, uh, asked the questions after who is responsible, who was responsible, who shouldn't be in a public um, office today because they had influenced biographies in this Germany when they, when they spied for the Stasi, etc., etc. We did a lot in this field and that was very important, I think, for the victims, but also um, to, to, to implement trust in the new institutions. So when the, uh, we uh, already in, in the late East Germany, we started to look into the files and look, uh, uh, did members of the parliament or the high officials in the public service uh, spied for the Stasi? And if they did so, we considered them not to be ready to serve in public office because um, they shouldn't uh, decide uh, over about biographies again of other people. What we maybe lacked um, was to listen more to the experiences of East Germans uh, of their how they see their efforts um, to survive somehow in East Germany, how their, 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 um, yeah, what they achieved in East Germany, in this, in this society. And um, there was a, um, a certain way of schematisch, we call them as um, So we, 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 we didn't take the time to look that uh, East Germany had, and, and, and the life in East Germany had many facets. And yes, it was a dictatorship, but even in the dictatorship, people lived their lives and um, achieved many things. And uh, at least some East Germans, it's not the majority, but some East Germans, a considerable number of East Germans, feel that their biography in this time is not uh, not considered worse as much as other other biographies, and that I think was a mistake. 